process of choosing speakers for the Good Leadership Breakfast is really an honor and a privilege. The speakers now come from recommendations of you. And we choose, um, we, I decide to put together um, a cultural mosaic of speakers who represent all sides of life. People in the first half of their career and people in the second half of their career. People who do nonprofit work, who have private enterprises, and people who are corporate leaders. And we particularly look for people who have a compelling story that they're willing to share about the intersection of their personal and professional lives. So today, I'm happy to say my friend David Sparkman helped me identify our speaker. I asked him, you know, who do you know that's really willing to put out a picture of what blending the seven Fs looks like? And my lunch with Rita was an exciting 45 minutes, and I know that you're in for a real treat. So please join me in welcoming a role model for blending the seven Fs, the president and CEO of the United Healthcare Community Health Plan of Tennessee, otherwise known as TenCare, Rita Johnson Mills. Thank you so much for being thank here. You. Enjoy. Good morning, and thank you all so much for coming. I feel that Dave introducing me to Paul was really a part of destiny. I lived here, my husband's son and I lived here about uh, two years ago, we moved to uh, Nashville. We lived here for about six, seven years, and we became huge Minnesota Lynx fans. We were season ticket holders, and we planned this session months ago for this morning, and how was it that I ended up last night at the best championship game that I have ever seen, regardless as to how it turned out? It was a great, great experience to be in that atmosphere, cheering on my Minnesota Lynx. So, thank you. As I said, we lived here uh, several years, uh, for, for seven years, been gone for two years, and when I came into this room, when I landed in Minneapolis, it really is coming home for me. I have so many friends and colleagues that are in Minneapolis, and I'm really, really thrilled that my uh, sorority sisters from Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated are here in the house to support me. Thank you all. All of the United Healthcare, United Health Group, current and former colleagues, thank you so much for being here. It just, I'm just overjoyed to see so many familiar faces that in many ways have heard different parts of my story and yet are back to hear it again. So thank you all so much for that. So to understand me and where I am currently in my career and where I have yet to go, you kind of have to understand where I came from. So I'm going to take just a few minutes to take you back in time to tell you the story about a little girl that was born in the boot hill of Missouri in a small town called Hayti. Most people have never even heard of it. It's right on the Arkansas-Tennessee border, born to a single female, one of 12 children. My mom is 87 years young and took care of all of us. And she didn't do too bad. I have four siblings that are ministers. I have four siblings that are military veterans. I have one sibling that is a small business owner. We also have a poet in our family. I have one sibling that is an REN. Four of us graduated from college two of us with advanced degrees. Not one of us spent a day in a jail cell. <laughs> okay? That's pretty awesome coming from the humble beginnings and a single mom. When my mom talks to people about me, she'll say, and my daughter is a CEO. Now, I don't know what that means. I don't know what she does, but she's the only CEO that I've got. 
So <laughs> that makes me feel pretty good too. So we grew up in a very, very rural area, really small town, in a two bedroom, what would be considered a shack if you saw it today. But for us, it was home and it was filled with love. I still don't know how we slept in that two bedroom house with as many of us as were in the home at any given time. I kind of view us as having kind of two families, the older half and then there's the lower half. But at any given time, there were seven of us in this two bedroom house. But we all survived and made it, primarily because it was filled with love. I grew up on Medicaid. I know what it's like to go into a doctor's office, be there first thing in the morning, but the last to be seen because you're not private pay. I never saw a dentist until I was in college. So these are the things that, because dentists didn't accept Medicaid in that little small town because they didn't have to. They had enough private pay. To cover, to cover their cost. My mom received a welfare check on us every month. And I remember going to the local grocer where he would give her credit. And if, she had, if her credit had exceeded the amount of that welfare check, we couldn't get anything. They, we would be turned away. We also got government commodities which really helped to spread the food. Now, most of you in this room probably don't know what government commodities are. But ask maybe some people you know, some parents or whatever, because I can tell you, it is some of the best cheese you will ever have in your life came from government commodities. Where I grew up, we didn't have easy bake ovens. We'd play outside in the dirt, and I made mud pies. And we made mud cakes. And we let it set in the sun until it got hard enough to get out. We played doctor. We played church. This picture here is from my childhood, me and two of my friends, because this is how it was. This was a typical afternoon, summer day of me and several others hanging out figuring out what's the next thing we're going to do. So I'll let you figure out which one of those three is me. <laughs> but one of them is me. I mentioned we had, I, I grew up with uh, a lot of siblings. But we loved each other, and we love each other. Now, don't get me wrong. We, my mom leave. We would fight like cats and dogs. But couldn't nobody else fight us. Nobody else, because if you jumped on one, you had to jump on us all. That's family. That's how we grew up. That's how she raised us. My mom had a very strong faith, and she passed that down to all of us. I was secretary of Sunday school, superintendent of Sunday school. Whatever it took, we did it. And there was not a Sunday our middle of the week that we weren't in our church. And the beautiful thing about that is, even if she didn't go, and we did something when we got out of line, anybody in that church could tear our behinds up. <laughs> and then when she, we got home and they told her, guess what? It happened all over again. <laughs> that was the love of being in that kind of a community. As I continue down memory lane, we get to picture number two. At the age of eight, I was picking cotton, picking strawberries, whatever it took to earn extra money. We would pick cotton and strawberries so we could have money to go to the state, to the little county fair, because if we didn't, there was no extra money, you didn't get to go. So that's how we earned our money. By the time I was 13, I was chopping cotton with a hoe. You probably don't know what a hoe is. You've probably never seen that either. But we, when you chop cotton, you have to get all the grass from around it. 
Again, over the summers, starting at age 13, I would work in the fields 12 hours a day, and we only made $10 for that labor. What you see on TV in these old movies is real. When they pass the water bucket around and everybody drinks, that's working in that field, drinks from the same dipper. I did that until I was 18 years old and went off to college. And things got a little bit better because by the time I was in my senior year, we were making, we were working only eight hours a day in the fields and making $25 for that eight hours of work. That's what it's like growing up poor in the South because Missouri, that part of Missouri is considered the South. I graduated high school in the top 10% of my class. Because one thing I'm really good at is going to school. I have a great memory. I can memorize stuff. I can take tests. School came really easy to me. This is a picture of my high school, Haytai High School. So graduating in the top 10, I went to my high school counselor and said, I won't call her name. I said, I want to talk about colleges. At that time, only one of my brothers was in college. No one really encouraged college. They didn't know how to. And she looked at me, and she said, college? Why are you asking me about college? Y'all don't go to college? You, you get a job. Maybe you get married and you have babies, but college is not in your future. So. I had no one else to encourage me, so I got a job. Fortunately, I didn't have babies and I didn't get married, but I didn't go to college. I got a job in a factory, and so when you go out and you look at your car and you see the name plate on the back of your car, whatever it says, Chevrolet, whatever, Buick, whatever, I used to make those. And production was six boxes a day and it was 600 name tags to a box. And when they came off that line, they were black and dirty and you had to shine them up. Suffice it to say, I could never make production. Even with others helping me, I never made production. And the foreman called me in and said, I'm, this was after about two months, I'm gonna have to let you go. This, you're not cut out for this work. And I looked at him and I said, you're absolutely right, but don't fire me. Let me work through the holidays and I promise I will quit. And I did. And that day I left there, I enrolled in college and went to Lincoln University that January. And I went year round. I went summers. So I graduated a four year program in three years. But that still wasn't enough because that job scared the heck out of me. I ain't want to work. <laughs> <laughs> so fortunately enough, uh, I, again, being one of the smarter African-American females, I got a curator scholarship to the Ohio State University, my alma mater. And I got into their master's program. And while I was at Ohio State, I spent two years there and I had a dual master's, one in public policy and management and one in human resource management. So that takes me through the first half of my life. The last uh, 18 or so years, I spent 10 years in state government with the state of Ohio, where I rose through those ranks, starting out as a policy analyst with the Department of Health, and then moving over to the Medicaid agency, where when I left, I had the, I was uh, chief of the Bureau of Medical Assistance and responsible for all of Medicaid with the exception of long-term care. I still didn't know where my journey was taking me, but I knew I wanted to do more. So I had an opportunity to apply for a job of uh, director of the Bureau of Medical Assistance with uh, HICFA, CMS now. And I got that job, and I went to CMS, and I stayed there for two years and really traveled the country. Had an opportunity to see every state's Medicaid program. And so when someone says, if you've seen one state's Medicaid program, you've seen one state's Medicaid program, it is absolutely true. I witnessed that directly. I only stayed at HICFA for two years, not because I didn't like the job, 
I did. But when you're in the federal government during an election year, and so I really can feel what the that team is going through now, decisions that you make are tied into the politics. And I that I didn't like some of the things I was asked to do, and I refused to do them because they compromised my integrity, because I wasn't political, I was not in a political role, so I felt it was best that I leave the federal government at that time. They actually, I actually had an opportunity to meet with the secretary then, because he wanted to know why I was leaving. And I hope I had some influence on that not happening to anyone else. Then I went to uh, Centene Corporation, which is another uh, large managed care company. I worked for Centene for six years, uh, starting out in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, moving on to uh, cover both the states of Ohio and, uh, and uh, Tennessee, and, uh, Ohio and Indiana. I had no intentions of leaving Centene. I interviewed with United doing a friend a favor because he begged me to interview with United. And I was like, I'm not looking for a job. Just do it for me. So the way he convinced me to do it was, you'll have an opportunity to meet Tony Welters. And for African Americans in the healthcare community, Tony Welters was just like, oh my God. You want to know him. He was just an amazing man. And that's why I interviewed, not only because I get to go and have lunch with Tony, and then I was going back to Indiana. I'd done my friend a favor. One of the things I can tell you is that when you meet with an inspirational leader, a leader that is very passionate about what they do, it's really hard to walk away. And I bought into Tony Welters long before I bought into United because I didn't know United. But I spent a lot of time with Tony and his team, and I was like, this is what I want to be a part of. When I was first hired at United, they didn't really know what they wanted me to do. So I've had about six roles in United, and that was one of the other reasons for joining United, is that I could be with an organization and never have to change companies. I could change jobs, but not have to change companies. So they knew they wanted me there, but they had no idea what they wanted me to do for about 60 days. I really had no job title. They didn't know what, I was just there. And so I took that time to learn the organization. I spent a ton of time on that website. I learned the different businesses. I managed through all of our self-service stuff. So by the time they really wanted me to work, I knew how to get around United. So that worked in my favor. After about three years, I was ready to leave United. I was going to leave United. And just at the point that I was ready to do that, we embarked upon our United culture change. And our CEO, Steve Hemsley, came to a meeting of the community and state leadership. And he said in front of probably a hundred of us, he talked about the culture journey and the culture, and he said, I have been guilty of stepping over debilitating bodies in the name of profit and performance. I have allowed people to be treated badly, and I'm not going to do that anymore. That was so powerful for me to hear the CEO of an organization say those words, and I never forgot it, that I said, I'm gonna give this dude a chance, I'm gonna sign up for another tour of duty and see if he delivers on what he's saying. <laughs> Thank you. And so since then, I've become a United Culture facilitator, work very closely with Dave and that team, and we are making, we have made a lot of change in our organization. We are no longer the company you want to be coming from. We are the company you want to be a part of. And I give that almost totally to the change that our culture and the values that guide our culture have, in, have instilled in us as leaders and the new leaders that we're bringing in. 
I've been in my current role, again, for two years. And you, some of you may be thinking, why would you leave a corporate job to go work in a health plan? In fact, I've done that before. I did it for Centene. I could do that with my eyes closed. I know how to build relationships. I know how to work with state government. So why would I leave that corporate job? Well, there's a couple of reasons, both personal and professionally. From a personal perspective, it got me closer to home. I needed, my husband and I wanted our son to know his family, his cousins, his aunts, his grandparents. And he couldn't do that with me traveling all over the country and moving from different states and, a cor and being in a corporate role. We were just too far away. So that was the personal reason for going. And then on a professional level, I had really forgot my core skill set of developing leaders. And when I took on a temporary assignment as the interim CEO of our Florida health plan, and I started spending time in the field in the health plan, and I began to help develop those leaders, that I was reminded of how I have a unique ability to get the best out of folks, to stretch them in ways that they had no idea that they could be stretched and that they could feel good. And I decided we need that in our health plans, which is what drives the success of United. And when the Tennessee plan came available, I jumped at it for those two reasons, because I wanted to give back and build our future workforce, and I wanted to be close to home. The roles I value most now, quite honestly, is that of wife, mother, daughter, granddaughter, sister, friend, cousin, because I get to do all of that at the same time as I get to work. I'm really enjoying being a football mom. I have a 17-year-old that will graduate next year. He is a 6A state football champion in the state of Tennessee. <laughs> and he wasn't just on the team. He played every, down, every offensive down of that championship game. So we're so very, very proud of him. So what's next for me? I don't know. I can tell you that if I had my crystal ball and I could kind of pick what I wanted to do and unite it, it would be United Healthcare's Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer. I believe that knowing the business is critical for diversity and inclusion. And that would be something that I think would be of tremendous value within our, within our overall business. If not in United, or leave United, I want to do something in the nonprofit world. I want to make sure that I'm constantly giving back to those little girls that look up that I call my mini me's. I want to create another me in, in that way. So in closing, I'll just kind of give, share a little bit of uh, advice, career advice, I guess, based on what I've learned in the uh, 20 plus years that I've been in the workforce. And you heard some of that, so I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. One is communications. You cannot overestimate the value of strong communications. And even if you think you're really, really good at it, keep working at it. There's always more to learn. Passion. It's incredibly important that you're passionate about what you're doing. Compensation and benefits will get old quick. I don't care how much money you're making, if you don't love what you're doing, you're not going to be good at it. So make sure that it's something you're passionate about and you love. Tenacity. You're going to fall, but you got to get up. I have fallen many times in my career. I have had to re-engineer myself, re-engineer my tool set, re-engineer my skills to move to do the things that I want to do. I have not, I have never, and I feel blessed, I have never asked myself, who moved my cheese? Never. Why did they take that away from me? I've always found a way to create new cheese, a brand that they just cannot resist, and they want to keep me there. 
Uh, Paul talked about physical fitness, at least to a sound mind. I learned that a little bit later in my career, but now I spend a lot of time on the physical fitness side, working out to clear my head. Talked a little bit about leadership. And I don't care how you define team, leadership is key. A strong leader must be decisive and must know when to seek input from others. We have to be problem solvers, not just problem identifiers. We have to be open to coaching. And I dare say, seek feedback and coaching, not wait for it to come to us, but constantly seeking that out. And alongside leadership comes team player. There will be times when more will be asked of us as leaders than we want to give, but that's just what leaders do. Jay talked about fun. I called it wit. You got to have some fun at work. If you can't laugh and talk with the people you're working with, it makes for a very, very bad situation. You, you, regret, you, you, you feel tense just walking into the building. One of the things that I admire that we do at United Health Group is what we call our uh, Celebrate Our People Week. And we spend a whole week just focusing in on making our employees feel good and proud that they work for United. I think the final thing that I will say is uh, integrity. Integrity is important. It's, one of, it's our number one value in United, and it just basically is doing what we say we're going to do. Also with integrity comes a sense of humbleness, being humble, and you don't hear that a lot in business, but you have to be approachable to be a good leader. You want to plan for your retirement. We talked about finance. You work hard, when you retire, you want to have some fun. So you don't want to not be planful there. And one thing that I tell people that I mentor is create your own personal board of directors. And those are the people that you can go to, depending on what's going on in your life. It can be clergy, it could be former bosses, it could be, you know, it could be a former teacher but always have a personal board of directors that's gonna be honest with you and help you to know the direction that you should go and tell you when you're not on the right track. So finally, I say be good to yourself because if you're not good to yourself, you're not gonna be able to be good to others. Thank you. Wonderful message, wonderful. Thank you so much. So uh, you heard a little bit about um, how I re-engineered myself. She talked about her re-engineering re herself. So the question that I'd like you to discuss here at the table is how many times have you reinvented yourself? And in what ways are those? This is a really important discussion question, very central to our theme of um, fairness. Ready, set, go. I'm seated here with Rita, our speaker, and I have a few questions for her. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. It's such a, uh, a joy for us to hear your story. Let's go back to your mother and her impact on, mm -hmm. particularly on your faith life. It was a vivid picture you painted mm -hmm. of Sunday school and how you <laughs> behaved there. How is your faith alive in your work today? We do a lot of work with uh, faith-based organizations, and we're not afraid when we, are, when we have a, a, a luncheon, and I go out to lunch with executives, CEOs all the time, and right before we eat, I always say, do you mind if I say grace? It, without except, with only one person that that is not surprised, and that's the former Medicaid director, Darren Gordon, because he has a very strong faith. But everyone else I do that with, they always say yes, and they smile, but the look on their face, mm -hmm. like, I'm not afraid of, of making it known that I believe in God and that I follow, that that's a part of who I am. And um, so that's, that's the one way it comes out on a personal level. That's confidence building. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, finances. You grew up dirt poor. <laughs> yep, those are my words. Yeah. 
And here you are. You're a CEO of a fabulously successful organization. How has that changed how you think about money? Well, it's, it's interesting that I still have that kind of a, of a poor person's mentality. So I'm, I, make, I save. I'm, I'm not frivolous. My son is an only child, but he doesn't get everything he wants. He has to earn it. Uh, he, you know, he didn't get a, a, a brand new car. He got a used car. You know, so trying to also teach him that value, and, and, and I believe in saving. I give a lot. I give a lot back. I am probably the uh, take care of my mom about 90% of, of her of her financial needs I help to meet but I'm still really pretty frugal because I don't see myself in that way. So uh, that was a vivid story you told about uh, Helmsley and the moment of uh, cultural change so you're one of the cultural ambassadors which is um, which is really interesting I think at your level um, what is the biggest change that you've seen in the organization since that day and since you've become actively involved as a cultural ambassador? Yeah. So the cool thing about being uh, working in culture and United and as culture facilitators, United made a very purposeful decision that its senior leaders would be the ones doing this. And like this was a kind of make recommendations mm -hmm. for speakers. We now make the recommendations for who's going to continue to become, be uh, culture facilitators within United. But for me, on a personal level, the biggest change was around balance. It was OK not to be doing email at midnight, because it didn't impress somebody that you weren't asleep <laughs> doing email. <laughs> you know? Uh, and I learned that the hard way. My husband and son and I were on vacation in Florida, and I had some meetings to do. And I got up early and went out on the patio, and this was several years ago. And I got caught up in one meeting, another meeting, and emails. And before I knew it, like four or five hours had passed, I walked back in. They were setting and ready to go. And I was like, oh, OK, y'all ready? Let's go eat. Like, we already ate. We, we left and came back, and you didn't know it. And then my son, who was 14 at the time, you know how teenagers are really smart now? And he said, yeah, Mom, while you were on PTO, you know, that pretend time off that United gives you. <laughs> we were, that, I was really mad at him, but then I was like, doggone it, he's right. Doggone it. He's right. Uh-huh. And so I, it was at that point that I decided when I'm on vacation, I'm on vacation. I've hired a team for a reason, and they're going to get it done, and it's not going to fall apart. So that was a personal change, that being a part of the culture group and, and culture requiring and saying, have balance, take time out that really kind of resonated with me and is something that I still do on a, on a continuous basis. I'm really glad I asked that question. <laughs> um, oh, final question. Um, I know this because you and I spent some time together. Um, <clears throat> you were the first African American invited back to give a speech at your high school graduation. Uh, tell us about that a little bit and what was your message? Well, uh, first thing you should know is that counselor was still there. But, <laughs> which is really, really sad. It was really sad that she's still there. Um, but I chose not to focus on her, but to focus on the graduates to help them to understand that you do not have to be a product of your environment. Do not allow someone to define you. You define you. And that you can be and do anything that you want to do regardless as to where you came from. And one of the final things I left with them is something that my mom would always say to us when people would come get down on us, is that you are special because God don't make no junk. <laughs>
Well said. Thank you. Please give it up for Rita Johnson Mills.